Amen. We're in Psalm 32. I thought I'd already done this psalm because, I mean, it, it is a major psalm, and I, 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 went to, I haven't done it yet. And so I said, why not? It is a powerful psalm. I titled Imputed Righteousness, and we need to discuss that word imputed. But before I get into that, this psalm is written by David as a result of his experience with sin and the subsequent forgiveness that he received from the Lord. As you might remember, David was not being very smart. He didn't go out to war with his generals. He stayed back at the palace, and there he dawdled. And he set his eye upon a woman that was not to be his. She was belonged to someone else. And he took her, and she became pregnant. Then she came to him and told him, I am with child. So he knew what would happen. Now, nothing would happen to him. He's the king. No one's going to touch him. And when touch him, he says, kill the person who's trying to touch me. <laughs> he knew he was safe, but he knew that she was bound to be dead as soon as they found out that she was with a child with another man other than her husband. Her death was certain. So he decided to save her life. So he decided, well, I'll bring her husband back from the wars, and then we'll cover up our sin. But the man they called back, named Uriah, he was not about to go back home and have pleasure with his wife whenever all the other men were out there in the field facing death. And so he refused to go home. So as a result, David still needed to cover up his sin. And so he wrote out a letter to his general. And he told him to send Uriah in the heat of the battle and then withdraw from him, effectively giving him a death sentence. And whenever the report came back to David that there is a, they got too close to the wall and many individuals died, other than Uriah himself, David was incensed and was angry at his general. But the general sent back a note saying, Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David knew why he did what he did. Is because of his command. At that point, he went and took the widow now and made her his wife. So he covered up his sin. At least, apparently, to everybody around him, he thought that maybe he had hidden his sin. But his heart was not right. He knew his God and he loved his God with all of his heart, mind, and soul. And he knew that what he had done was horrendous. The first sin was great. The second sin was even greater, taking a man's life. He was guilty of blood guiltiness. And it got down into his soul and it ate him alive. Nathan the prophet comes subsequently to that. Of course, the baby dies. But Nathan comes and tells David, a story, a story about a man with a little lamb, a poor man with a little lamb, who was in the vicinity of a rich man who had many lambs. And the rich man had somebody come visit him, and he wasn't willing to kill any of his sheep, so he took the poor man's sheep and slaughtered him and ate him. David was incensed. He jumped up from his throne and said, show me the man he will no longer live. And Nathan pointed his finger at David and said, you're the man. And David was undone. He knew, God knew, he couldn't hide it from God, but now God is revealing it to the prophets. He was exposed and the guilt overwhelmed him. But in that, he had a relationship with God. He remembered his God. And he confessed his sin to the Lord. Go to Psalm 51, and you can read that whole process that he went through. Psalm 32 is a psalm that is written as a result of God's forgiveness in David's life. The pain and the suffering is there, 
but it is mostly his what has happened to him in his heart and soul when he found a God full of grace and mercy and kindness. That word impute is important. In Romans 6, 7, and 8, he's quoting out of Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, but it says, saying, Blessed are they those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Imputing sin is crediting it to him, credit it to him, uh, giving it to them and saying, this is yours, this belongs to you. Now, there is possibility of falsely imputing things to people, like, for example, with Hannah. Hannah was a lady that was expecting, a, wanting a baby very badly, and she was not having any children. And so she was before the Lord at the temple, not, not the temple, but at the tabernacle. And Eli, the, pro, the priest, saw her, and he saw her move, moving her lips, but no words were coming out. And he imputed to her drunkenness. He imputed that she was drunk. And as a result of that, he came up to her and treated it as if she was drink, drunk. He acted toward her as if she was drunk. He imputed drunkenness to her, and he came and behaved toward her as if she was drunk. And she said, no, she was speaking out in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard, so Eli imputed that she was drunk. And then she said, no, I am not drunk. I am not. But I am deeply moved in my spirit, and I'm praying to my God. And he repented of that. Now, there is another positive imputation that takes place where God imputes something that doesn't exist on something that should not have it. And that is when we find Abraham. And it says there that Abraham believed in the Lord, and God, he reckoned him, and imputed it to him as righteousness. This is extremely important because. No way is righteousness equivalent to believing. Righteousness that he's talking about here is the very righteousness of God himself, not our righteousness, which we might be able to manufacture or might be able to fool people that we have. It is the very righteousness of God that God says, because Abraham believed, I impute, I reckon it to him, I credit it to him that he is now righteous. Extremely important. Romans 4.22 brings that out as well in telling us that is the same way God saves us. When we believe God about his son Jesus, that he went to the cross carrying our sin, my sin, and he died for me, and he was poured out his life for me, and he was buried, and then he rose again from the dead. If I believe that testimony, an unbelievable testimony, if I believe that testimony, then God reckons to everyone who does believe the very righteousness of God, just as he did with Abraham. So in Romans 4, 23 and 24, it says this, Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was imputed to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be imputed as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So when we talk about the imputed righteousness of Christ, this is something major that God has done for you. He imputed to you, first of all, when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he imputed, first of all, to you that you did not have any sin whatsoever. Jesus paid it all, completely eliminated it. There is no imputed righteousness or sin in you at all. There's nothing there. It is gone. And instead of the imputed sin, there is this imputed righteousness, the very righteousness of God that belongs to you. Do you feel it? Does it build inside your heart and your soul this mighty work that God has done inside of you? It should. So we start with Psalm 30, verse 1. David saw this. David experienced this horrendous sin that he committed. You know, in America today, a lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, I, I, I was born in America, and I haven't murdered anyone lately. And they think that they're okay because they, you know, these gross sins are not part of their life. But David knew sin intimately. He did sin greatly before his God. And having adultery with his 
soldier's wife and then killing the very soldier so that he could cover up that sin from mankind. And he dealt with it, and God gave him an imputed righteousness. He gave him an imputedness, sinlessness as well. And so he says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It's one of the Beatitudes. Remember, Romans, uh, Matthew chapter 5 starts off with a uh, blessed be. And it goes, a lot of these blessed. David has his own Beatitudes. Blessed are you. Blessed are you whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Can you feel it, what's happening in David as he has wrestled with this? This is what he says. He says this what? When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. I'll just leave it there. He, he, was, he was deeply troubled by his sin, and it was getting to his heart. Have you ever had that experience? When you told a lie to somebody, did it eat at your heart and soul? Or did it just, oh, that was just a little white lie, and you let it go by and allowed the sins to build up and build up and build up? How are you going to deal with it if you build up up so much and you never deal with them before the day of redemption and you stand before God without knowing forgiveness, without knowing the great love that God has for you as he imputes no sin to you through your request of forgiveness and imputes instead the full righteousness of God himself? I don't know. What would it be like to be going in before the King of kings and the Lord of lords with a big bag of sin in my life that has never been dealt with? But David says, this is what was happening to me, and I did something about it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says this, Better suffer all the diseases with the flesh is heir to than lie under the crushing sense of the wrath of Almighty God. Isn't that true? Wouldn't it be better to deal with coronavirus coupled with Ebola and something else as well, than to have God working in your heart, crushing your spirit because of your sin in your life. He goes on to say, the Spanish Inquisition with all of its tortures was nothing to the inquest which conscience holds within the heart. Remember Macbeth? It's a old writing, I think, of, of uh, William Shakespeare, where the lady has, a, I think it's her husband that she accompanied or uh, helped kill, and she sees these blood spots on her hands, and she can't get rid of them, and she is, goes crazy and insane because of the guilt that she has put upon herself. And man has that same working inside of our hearts and souls. And there are two things, two different ways that it works. There is one that is a a sorrow that leads to death. And the other one is a sorrow that leads to life. God gives it to us so that it leads us to life. That we are crushed with that sorrow in our heart that forlornness, that feeling that God has forsaken us. I know I experienced that for six months in my life. I had a verse of scripture even that condemned me every single day, 50 times a day. It condemned me for six months until I met my Lord and asked him, God, I said, if indeed I have lost my salvation, if indeed I've lost my way with you completely, then that's okay. You're God. You can judge me. But if there's a way back to you, bring me back. Wipe that verse from my mind. For six months, I had it on my heart and my mind and my soul. 
eating away at my soul. When I got up from that grassy place, I could no longer remember that verse. I knew where it was, so I didn't go look for it. I didn't go look for it. But I knew that my God had touched me. I knew that this conscience that I was dealing with had been met. And God took the iniquity of my heart and did not impute it to me any longer. Didn't longer credit it to me, but instead credited to me the very righteousness of God himself. Amazing thing. Verse 34 says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Now that's the way it was. But you know what that says? It says Salah. Salah is a, they really don't know what it means. But it's like it's a change. He's already said one way, and the, the music is going one way, and then Salah, all of a sudden, it changes to another tune, another way, another, another way of looking at this, this thing, another tempo, I guess you might say, something that is happening, a crescendo or something goes on, because in verse 35a, it says this, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. Finally, my mind came back to myself. Why am I carrying this load on my heart and soul? Why am I doing this? When I've got a God who says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. When shall I come to the understanding that God wants to reason with me, that I don't have to carry this load any longer? So I come to you and I acknowledge, God, this is sin. This is horrendous sin that I have committed I did not hide any iniquity from you, but God, I am before you. I am undone. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. You leave those things behind, and God will meet you on the other side. Taking away the sin through the precious blood of Jesus, we sang about it just a little while ago, and he's able to cleanse you from the top to the bottom, and they're absolutely free from that. And instead of the dark, horrible sin in your life, God leaves behind the fresh fragrance of his righteousness. There is no iniquity within you any longer. It says this, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And now he says, Salah again, he's going to change his tune again. And what he does is an amazing thing. It's out of 1 John 8 and 10, 1, 8 and 10. You remember these things. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. There is a means. I meet people that say, I have not sinned. I have not anything, any reason to say uh, that I'm sorry to God. I have no sin in my life. What does the scripture say to a person that says that the truth is not in you? We have also to say that we have, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We need to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are in need of forgiveness and all are offered that forgiveness if we will but say to ourselves, like David said, why am I carrying this with me? I can come to my God and lay it before him. If he kills me, he kills me. But I am done with carrying my sin. I am done with carrying my attitude against my brothers and sisters. I am done with all of this. And I come to God for his, either his forgiveness or him to put me out of my misery. But I'm coming to my God. And my God says, all who come to me, I will listen and I will heal all who come. There's not a one that is excluded. God didn't say that he's not willing, then he should perish and all come to repentance. And then finally you drag yourself into his presence and he says, oh, I did say that. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. I guess you can come in too. It is not there. When you come, it is him choosing you because you would not be able to come unless he does choose you. And he chose you the first. All are chosen first. 
You've all been in the game of baseball where you all the kids back and go to the backstop and they pick and choose team members. And finally you get to the last guy and say, uh, last two guys. And then one guy says, well, you can have them both. I was one of those guys. But when my God chose me, he chose me first. When God chose you, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, he chose you first. From the foundation of the world, his foreknowledge is full and complete. I'm not talking predestination here. I don't understand God, and I don't even come close to understanding how he thinks and how he does things. His ways are way higher than mine. If you can figure it out, you're better than me. And that's not saying much. But God is God. And he tells us what he does with us. 1 John 1, 9. Remember I told you to write it on the back of your skull. So anytime you get in trouble with sin, that you're able to just look up and see that verse. Memorize it, in other words. Get it into your heart and soul. It'll save you a lot of sorrow. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To you, O God, I acknowledge my sin. To you, O God, I come for that cleansing. And God says, come. And you know the thing about this verse? It's an amazing verse. Because it says if we confess the things that we know about, that God will not only, not only forgive those things that we've confessed, but he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even the things that we have no conception of that we have done, God cleanses for. We can stand before him this day. Once we've confessed, we can stand before him clean, clear through, without any spot or wrinkle, full of the righteousness of God himself. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time which you may be found. We are living in the time where he may be found. The time from Christ until the time of the judgment is a time of grace. The age of grace is where we're living in. And God has opened the door for all to come in. All. To come in. Not anyone should be left behind. Not anyone should be out there losing their soul at the end of their days. All are welcome to come. Now is the time. He says, everyone who wishes to be godly, who is godly, come and pray. Now. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. The way God saves is amazing. Every one of you have a different testimony about how God has met you and dealt with you. Wondrously things. I came this way, you came that way, another person came another way, but it is God who is doing it all and he is doing it wondrously. He doesn't have to repeat himself on his salvation things. We think, oh my goodness, that person came to Christ and uh, look what they came out of. Oh, my. You know, God's really saved something when he saved. I mean, he, he really had to hold his nose on that guy. And then some of us come to Christ, and we just kind of grew up in the church, and we just came along, and we said, this makes sense, and we believed it, and we got baptized, and we we're just believers because we, you know, there wasn't any big sins in our lives that had to be dealt with. There was no big deal. But I want you to know if you know Jesus Christ, one person's testimony is no bigger than the other person's testimony. It is the greatest thing in the world. You are a miracle if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. A miracle has occurred for you to know him. For you to understand that Jesus died for me. That is a miracle. And it says, surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. When the judgment comes, when the day comes at the end, when Jesus Christ comes back, not to deal with sin, but to deal, deal with, do, do away with sin. When that day comes, a great flood will be a coming and it will take many lives, but it will not touch you. Won't even touch you. 
Great is God's grace to us. Verse 7 says this, You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the songs of deliverance. This is what he does. God is our hiding place in the midst of a world that is scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oftentimes I think of, of Africa when I think of this. You know, almost everything out there is ready to eat you or kill you with poison or give you a tsetse fly bite and then you've got sleeping sickness or whatever. But this whole world is out to get us. It's out to destroy us, to keep us from the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan pulls all the stops out, tries to deceive, and tries to, to cause men who even make a decision for Christ to forget their decision for Christ. He does that. We're in a battle for the souls of individuals, our own souls, as we go through this. But God is our hiding place. We can come to him and find that place of hiding. You preserves me from trouble. Oh God, you preserve me. He doesn't keep me from tr trouble. He preserves me from trouble. I don't know, but I think when we make preserves, don't we have to heat it? Isn't that right? You make preserves, you heat it, and then you put it in the boil, and then get sealed in that thing, and you got these things preserved there. They had to go through a little bit of pain to get there, but they're preserved. And God allows us pain this momentary light affliction that Paul's caused about, no problem. But at the end of the thing, we've got God. And he's calling us home. And we're going to be transformed into the very image of his son, Jesus Christ, on that day. And all the sins of the world are going to be gone. All the sins that drug us down won't be even remembered. And the glory of God will be ours. Yeah, you surround me with the songs of deliverance. How does that happen? Because he places him in the midst of a bunch of believers who want to say, thanks, God. And they're full of songs in their heart of hearts. I'm starting to do something different. Uh, when I start thinking about this, giving a sermon on Sunday morning, I start singing psalms. I know that no one else is hearing me other than God, which is probably good, but it fills my heart. When is it that we say, God, I need my heart filled? Start singing the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs making a melody in your heart to the Lord for the mighty works that he has done in life. Keep your focus on, this is the, the wonder of this psalm, is one that gets us going in our hearts and minds and saying, yes, yes, Lord, you did save me. Yes, you did take away that horrendous sin that was dragging me down and would have dragged me to hell itself. But you have taken that away and I've been given the very righteousness imputed with the righteousness of Christ himself and it is going to be glorious and it's going to be a wondrous thing that you're going to do in my life. Salah, God, change my ways, O Lord. Now, change my ways. How quiet we are about our salvation. I'll get into that in just a little bit here. Verse eight says this. I will instruct you. This is God speaking. This is the change that gives here. The Salah here changes to God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. And I will counsel you with my eye upon you. That's what God says to each and every one of you. He's there. He is there. He is there. And he is listening. And he is seeing. Can you comprehend a mind that is able to do that to seven and a half billion people upon the face of this earth and watches over the sparrows as well? This is a great God that we have. In him we move and breathe and have our being. He is much bigger than what we think he is. There's a book that's written called Your God is Too Small. It's time for us to see the God who we have and not allow yourselves to give up one beachhead to Satan in your life. You are the saints of the living God. 
called forth by his grace and his mercy to be his. He will teach you in the way you should go. Open your eyes and say, Lord, you're listening to me. I'm going to listen to you. Verse 9 says this, Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bride, bridle, to hold them in check. Otherwise, they would not come near you. Don't be like the horse or the mule. It didn't even mention the donkey. I guess the mule is kind of a combination of horse and donkey, but nevertheless, maybe he's included in there. But don't be like them. They don't have any understanding. They don't know why you're making them pull that thing that chases them down the road. They have no idea what they're doing. They just know they do it or else they get beat. Don't be like that. Don't let God have to beat you. Some of us need to be beaten to church. <laughs> you know, somebody with a stick, get into church and get there quick. But don't be like that. Have your mind set on this great God that has taken the effort to get rid of all your sins. Verse 10, now he comes and talks about two different types of people. There are two types of people in the world. The first one is, many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. The warning is out there. We look around and say, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are wicked, that are, are doing really well. They're financially well off. They've got billions of dollars or whatever it may be. But they're, they're obviously not believers. And they're obviously not walking with God. And here I am, this person that is just barely able to eke living out of, out of this society around me or anything else in between between those things. He says, wait a second. The sorrows of the wicked, if they're not experiencing now, they are saving them up for later. And they will experience the sorrows. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God knows what he's doing. And we don't look at that that way. We look at it the other way. But he who trusts the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Doesn't say wealth shall surround him. Doesn't say good health will surround him. What it says is God's loving kindness will surround me. Wherever I go, whatever I do, God's loving kindness will surround me. Verse 11, last verse, says this. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous one, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Last time you shouted for joy for your salvation, what did God say to you that caused you to shout for joy? Oh, wait, did you do it? Did you shout for joy? I, I found this at this Charles Spurgeon stuff again. Our happiness should be just demonstrative. That's a word, isn't it? Chill penury, which is poverty of love, often represses the noble flame of joy. I was preaching some time ago, and um, quite a few years ago, in fact, and this young lady came up to me and said, sometimes when you're preaching, my heart is going, yay! But my outside, I'm saying, I hope nobody's seeing me do that. I'm not speaking that we ought to just be up and jumping around and hollering and screaming boisterous over the things that God has done for us. But maybe we need to be more demonstrative of this great God that has worked his wonders in our lives. And men whisper their praises decorously where a hearty outburst of song would be far more natural. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you saved? Yeah, I'm, I'm saved. Wow, that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Well, I'll see you later. Yeah. Or do you say... Are you a saved man? Are you a saved man? Yeah, I'm a saved man. God saved me. Hallelujah. Wasn't it a great glorious thing? How did it happen to you? Have you done that with your neighbors lately? I haven't. I've been... It's amazing that I even talk. <laughs> Back when I was young, I didn't talk. I had a girl come up to me one day and says, Don't you ever smile? And I didn't say a word to her, but inside I said, nope, <laughs> don't smile at all. 
When I came to Christ, I started smiling and my mouth hurt. It hurt because the muscles had never been used for years. I didn't know how to smile. I probably looked like, a, like I had fangs or something. I, I, I don't know, but I was smiling in my heart and, and the smile was coming out of my face. I know because God had done a wondrous thing in my life. Has he done a wondrous thing in your life? Be happy about it. And let people know that you're happy about it. He says, it is to be feared that the church of the present day, through a craving for excessive propriety, this is written back in the 1800s, is growing too artificial so that inquirers, cries, and believers' shouts would be silenced if they were heard in our assemblies. Yeah. Somebody comes in and says, hallelujah. Oh, shh, don't do that. We're all just quiet in here because the pastor doesn't want to be disturbed with outbursts of joy. Now, I'm not saying that everybody ought to be doing that. I'm not trying to, trying to change our culture here. But open your mind to the reality. Am I quiet because I'm afraid that somebody's going to judge me as being too voiceless or too exuberant or that I'm weird? Just take it for granted. You're weird. Okay? And believe that God does mighty things in us. And we need to express those mighty things. There are many grumpy Christians in this world. And the reason why they're grumpy is they're not hearing their brothers and sisters expressing the great goodness that God has done for them so that they can say, you know, God has been doing something in my life too. I can say that. They have no example of anything that is, is going on inside the heart and soul. I praise my God for what he has done in my life. Do you? Do you? Do you really? Yeah, let's tell people about that. This may be better than boisterous fanaticism, but there is as much danger in the one direction as the other. Yeah, we don't, we're not, we're not fanatics. We're fun addicts. <laughs> F-U-N. That God is fun. He is awesome. He is holy. He is righteous. But he also loves us. And that is a great joy. For our part, we are touched by the heart by a little sacred excess. Let's get a little sacred excess going inside of our hearts. There's a God in heaven that saves us and delivers us. And when godly men and their joy overleap the narrow bounds of decorum, we do not, like Michael Saul's daughter, eye them with a sneering heart. Remember? David comes in with the ark of God, and he's dancing before it, whether he's naked or whether he's almost naked, it doesn't matter. He's just, he's out there doing it. And Michael, his wife, calls him on the carpet about it. She's despised him in her heart. It's hard for us human beings to be godly. Because there's so many things that keep telling us to cram it, to shove it, to keep quiet about it. And I don't know what it's like to be a boisterous believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I know that I love my God. And I know I love you. And I know that God's great work in all of us needs to be extolled to, th to the world around us. We can tell the stories of God's great works in the Bible, but what about the God's great works in you? We need to hear it. We need to hear it. I've talked about it over and over again. Anytime that you have a testimony that you want to give, this pulpit is open for you to do so. Anytime that God's moved in your heart and soul that you want to stand up in the crowd and say, today I want you to know that I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime. 
That is not boisterous. That is not out, not out of decorum. That is, that is an expression of the heart, and it'll be welcomed. We don't want to be like Michael. Shout joyfully to the Lord, it says in 94, Psalm 94. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, and with the lyre and with the sound of melody. With trumpets and with the sound of the horn, shout joyfully before the King, the Lord. What a great God we have. What are we going to see when he moves through us? Back in 1905, a little girl inside of a meeting house where the pastor was trying to get them to talk and they wouldn't talk, this one little girl had the bravery to stood up and said, I love the Lord Jesus. That's all she said. And the Spirit of God came upon them in power, and a revival broke out in that little church in Wales, and it went around the world. Who knows what might happen if we all take Psalm 32 and say, that's my psalm. That's what God has done for me. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Psalm 107. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's say so. I've been redeemed. How do you do it? Well, have you been redeemed? Have you been enthusiastically redeemed? Have you been excitedly redeemed? All right, let the saints of the Lord say so. I've been redeemed. Let's say it. I've been redeemed. What a great God we have. What a great salvation he brought to us. Blessed be his holy name. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so very much for your word and the power it is. I pray that you work our work deeply inside of us, so deeply that we are transformed into the individuals that express our faith with one another, our joy with one another, and that we drag people in here to, with a great amount of enthusiasm for your word is going to be spoken here, Lord. And your ways are going to be delivered. And we are going to be the redeemed who say so. Thank you, O oh God. I pray that for anyone that has not believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, are thought that they believe, but can tell in their heart that they are not believers, that they will pray right now with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my life and receive you as my personal Savior, Lord. I repent of my sins. I turn away from the darkness. And I turn to you, O God. Make me the person you want me to be. But I believe that, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you died on the cross for me, that you were buried, and that you rose again from the dead. And I put my faith and trust in you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.